I just want to talk in a bit more detail about the nitty gritty of who the accusers were, who the accused were. So I just want to read a quote from Francis Hill's book. No one has ever satisfactorily explained why witches have mostly been women. Since witch accusers have also often been women, probably more often than men, the explanation cannot simply be man's fear and hatred of females. Macfarlane's guess is that women as wives, mothers and gossips were more centrally involved in village life than men, more likely to wield power at village level and more likely to be lenders and borrowers. They were therefore more likely to arouse the guilt, hate and envy that would lead to accusations. It may be that postmenopausal women, no longer confined to the childbearing role and inclined to assert themselves, tended to be viewed as aggress aggressive and threatening. And witchcraft was unquestionably an expression of aggression in the witchcraft accuser, if not the witch. End quote. Um, I think, uh, in terms of the idea that many of them were postmenopausal women, what's also an interesting idea, perhaps with these young female accusers, was looking at these older women maybe a reminder of where they were going? Did it scare them to look at these women? Could they not bear to think of themselves as becoming like that? So maybe they wanted to destroy them? I don't know, it's just an idea. Um, and then Hill goes on to sort of talk about some of the feminist ideas um, of, of why women are accused. So, you know, perhaps um, because some of them were financially independent, that's another frequent thing that comes up with people who are accused of witchcraft. And of course, there were many uh, factors in play and that's very, very possible. However, she goes on to say, uh, one more thing, which is that it seems likely that people accuse women, not men, of witchcraft for the reason that in all Western cultures, girls and women subtly torment each other with words, looks or silences, while boys and grown men physically fight or shout blatant insults. Women's habitually more covert tactics in any struggle for power make them more suspect when the methods of attack are invisible. End quote. Of course, there will be many factors at work here. Um, there's a theory that poorer or lower status targets made people feel guilty, so they took it out on them. There's also this idea that they saw people accused of witchcraft as being angry and full of rage. Well, maybe that's an anger and rage that they felt in themselves and that they wanted to destroy because perhaps they felt ashamed of it. Think about the feminist rage wrestling that I've just played a clip of. Um, and many Me Too accusations, perhaps they're people who just maybe feel jealous of higher status figures and want to bring them down. Of course, many of them won't have been caused by that, but perhaps some of them are based on jealousy when you really get down to it. Maybe this modern social justice obsession with power, thinking that every interaction in the world occurs because someone's trying to take power from someone else, is all down to the fact that maybe they're the ones that want to take power and keep others down. As the witch trials progress, what is very important to remember is the nature of who is being accused changes. As things went on, many of the accused hadn't just fallen, but they had also risen in status. For example, the nurse family were successful farmers, and we really get a sense of the Putnam's envy when they start accusing people like that. And as things progress, they actually start accusing wealthy merchants and wealthy people really could not believe what was happening until it started happening to them and by this point the girls were accusing people they had never even seen before and in the courtroom people would literally be seen whispering names into their ears um, because what would happen would be that people would be brought into the courtroom and of course the girls hadn't seen them before so people would whisper oh this is so and so say their name and by this stage Nobody cared. This behaviour was seen. Nobody cared. Nobody did anything about it. And beyond the initial stage, what's also clear is that things were set up very, very carefully. The lower downs were accused first, and then they slowly, slowly accused people in a very specific order so that they could get to their main targets. And their absolute biggest target was a man called George Burroughs. He had been the vicar in Salem Village and had left several years before because of disagreements with the Putnams and he was set up very, very carefully. 
um, in the girls' accusations, which, by the way, were always led by Anne Putnam, they kind of made him the leader of the witches' Sabbath. They kind of made him almost the devil or antichrist figure that led this coven of hundreds of witches. And all the stories of the visions that the girls were having placed him at the epicentre of all the devilish activity. And what is interesting is that, of course, the number one hit on their list was a man. Interestingly, the only accused witch that came to trial and was released was also a man who argued very, very well. And he actually said, are you sure this is me that you're talking about? Are you sure this is me that you've seen in all your vision visions? And the judge was so affected by this, he said to, to the accusers, come on, let's go outside and look at this man in the light of day. And somehow in the light of day, these girls faltered and they sort of said, no, 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 we've made a mistake. Let's let him go. Um, and this trick did not actually uh, work in future. Nobody else was, was released. But in this one scenario, somebody was released and it was actually a man. So what's important is to remember that there are lots of women in the middle of this, accused accusers. However, at the end of this bell curve, at one end and the other, there are men. Make of that what you will. The final category of accused witch that I want to talk about is the skeptic. Not that that has any relevance to things that are happening today. They seem to have saved their worst for the skeptics and the absolute worst of their worst for people who had at one time been with them and who then decided to express skepticism. So again, if you know the story of the crucible, um, you will be maybe disappointed to know that actually the historical character of Abigail Williams is only 11 years old and there is no evidence that she and John Proctor ever knew each other. However, the character Mary Warren pretty much does have the journey that Arthur Miller gives her. Um, so John Proctor was a known sceptic and he was also somebody that was very respected and um, again, like in, in the play, his word, his name does mean something. And to have somebody like that expressing scepticism would not have looked good for the accusers. However, Mary Warren, his servant, had at one time joined the accusers and been having fits with the rest of them. And this annoys John Proctor so much, he kind of declares he's going to beat the devil out of her, which he probably did, obviously. Beating people is not good. But apparently... Mary stopped having fits and then at one point was heard to claim the afflicted persons did but dissemble. And of course this A sent the accusers absolutely wild and B gave them even more reason to want to get John Proctor and his wife as well. Um, so Mary Warren finally finds herself accused and sees all her friends that she had been, you know, having fits with and rolling around on the floor with, suddenly at the sight of her having fits and going absolutely crazy. And all of this kind of is a bit too much for her and she actually does kind of give in and confess and say that yes, people are coming to strike me down, but you can tell she's very, very conflicted because she refuses to name names. She really, really does not want to implicate John Proctor or his wife because obviously she knows that they're, they're good people. However, after she was tortured for several weeks, apparently she confessed to anything and everything. And the way that they would get people to confess, the way they would torture them would be by tying them at neck and heels. So tying them in a way that bound the, the backs of their feet all the way around to their neck. And apparently after this had been done for so long, blood would start to gush out of the person's nose. Interestingly, John Proctor's son was tied like this and did have blood gushing out of his nose and still did not accuse his father, which I guess is a testament to um, what the Proctor family was like. And of course, the whole fulcrum, the whole crux of the crucible is that if you are a respected person with any kind of position of power or influence, you have to be made to conform and made to agree. And if you don't, things will be made very difficult for you. And of course, John Proctor gives his life for this. And I just want to play a clip um, to you of something that happened to a person who is supposed to be part of these oppressed minorities who did express scepticism and who is then forced to conform in a way that is absolutely 
horrible and humiliating to her. Well, I'll just speak up because somebody keeps interrupting this man. I'm still trying to wait for him to answer the question whether it's bullshit or not. I want to hear what he has to say. Oh, yeah. so he he done. Oh, oh, so he done. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Just turn, just turn, y'all. You know. These are the lost ones. The lost ones are rising. Pay no attention. Nobody's going to get to I don't know the guy. I just want to get to know them. Know him. That's all. I've noticed that he's been targeted and whatnot, or he's been a uh, uh, bad guy to people. And I'm like, hey, everybody sees that too. I, mean, I want to get to know the guy. He looks like a cool guy to hang out with. This is what I'm asking. Dialogue. It's not so tough. We're just having a private conversation. And? Whereas peaceful protesters were assaulted by Pol Evergreen Police Officer Timothy O'Dell over a false report made by Professor Brett we uh, Weinstein. Piece of shit. We're moving on. And whereas the labor for drama dramatic change in the institution has fallen on black fem fem students. Instead of paid administrators or other white bodies. In response of these recent events and the cyclical, such big words, <laughs> natural nature of anti blackness and racism at the Evergreen State College, students are engaged, engaging in an ongoing struggle for equity, equity? equity. equity on campus. Just as then, confessors like Mary Warren were very, very useful. Luckily, in 1692, they were actually too useful to die. It is possible that the authorities intended to execute them eventually because they did remain in jail, but they escaped because the hanging stopped as soon as the reality of the executions hit people. But their confessions were what was feeding the machinery. The confessors had to find other people to accuse in order to secure their position. And this is probably how the person, arguably, that was, you know, in the most vulnerable position, Tituba, manages to survive the Salem witch trials. We can see from Tituba's hearing records that everything the judge said was designed to Kafka trap her and her guilt was completely assumed from the start. And she did start off denying it, but there comes a point where she cracks and you can see she's clearly a very intelligent person who is thinking on her feet and she ends up confessing to the most extraordinary things, none of which, by the way, has anything to do with the Caribbean. Everything she mentions is English in character, as were all the superstitious behaviours that had started things off. Most of the imagery in her confession and in the visions that people would see was actually an inversion of Christian practices rather than anything that was sort of magic per se. Um, Tituba's confession is what enabled the trials and the executions to proceed in the way that they did, but it also saved her life and is probably exactly what I would have done if I found myself in that situation. And the fact that she and her husband both survived the Salem witch trials is not what you'd expect because this society was really racist. This was a society that owned slaves. Actually, one accused individual said, well, John Indian's testimony doesn't count against me because he's black. So these people were racist. However, John Indian's status as an accuser trumped the prejudice against his race. And he obviously understood that. The authorities, again, may have intended Tituba and John to die. They probably did not care about their lives one way or the other. However, they were just obviously not the primary target, just like we cannot say that the primary criteria for being accused was being female. There were also confessors who recanted, and I'm going to tell the story of Margaret and George Jacobs because, frankly, they deserve to be remembered and they deserve our respect. George, Jacob, George Jacobs was a known sceptic. He was in his 70s when he ended up being accused by his servant, who was an orphan, probably because she saw a way to finally get some status of her own. And at his hearing, George famously said, well, burn me or hang me, I will stand in the truth of Christ. And uh, his relatives actually managed to save his body and these words are now inscribed on his gravestone. His granddaughter, Margaret, who was 16 at the time, was also accused and she decided to confess. And part of that was that she had to accuse her grandfather and she also had to accuse George Burroughs. Probably, you know, she had her whole life ahead of her. So this is why she kind of thought, OK, it's fine for me to give up my grandfather uh, his life in, in exchange for mine. He may even have encouraged her to do this. 
However, a few weeks later, she gave up her freedom because she just couldn't live with what she had done. Her recantation is incredibly moving and I'm actually going to read it in full. May it please the honoured court. I was cried out upon by some of the possessed persons as afflicting them. Whereupon I was brought to my examination, which persons at the sight of me fell down, which did very much startle and affright me. The Lord above knows I knew nothing in the least measure how or who afflicted them. They told me without doubt I did, or else they would not fall down at me. They told me if I would not confess, I should be put down into the dungeon and would be hanged, but if I would confess, I should have my life. The very first night after I had made my confession, I was in such horror of conscience that I could not sleep for fear the devil should carry me away for telling such horrid lies. The Lord, I hope, in whom I trust, out of the abundance of his mercy will forgive my false forswearing of myself. What I said, which was altogether false against my grandfather and Mr Burroughs, which I did to save my life and to have my liberty. But the Lord, charging it to my conscience, made me in so much horror that I could not contain myself before I had denied my confession, which I did though I saw nothing but death before me choosing rather death with a quiet conscience than to live in such horror which I could not suffer. Whereupon my denying my confession, I was committed to close prison, where I have enjoyed more felicity in spirit a thousand times than I did before in my enlargement. Margaret Jacobs was jailed and asked to see George Burroughs, who forgave her and also prayed with her before he died. Luckily, she wasn't executed because she fell ill at the time of her trial, but she remained in jail for a year after the other witches were freed because she couldn't afford to pay the jail fees. Another instance of bravery I'm going to discuss is the case of Giles Corey, who was 81 years old. He was accused and refused to plead either guilty or not guilty, and at that time, if you didn't plead, they could not try you. So in order to force someone to plead, they were allowed to press them with weights. And Giles Corey was pressed with rocks for days before he died. And he did not even cry out in pain, which is apparently very rare to find an example of someone who undergoes this kind of torture who doesn't cry out. Um, the reason he did this was to stop his goods being confiscated, which they would have been if he had been found guilty of witchcraft. But that didn't stop the sheriff from actually extorting money from his sons after he died by threatening to confiscate his proper property anyway. What's important is that this was the first time that pressing had actually happened in New England and probably thanks to his bravery, it never happened again in American history. And it also seems to have unsettled people so much that they kind of lost their appetite for this kind of punishment and became a lot less enthusiastic about the witch hunt in general. The story of Giles Corey shows us the importance of legal rights. In this instance, the right to remain silent and it shows us what happens when we take that away. But I think in a way, the most important lesson we can learn from the witch trials as a whole is the importance of due process because none of these tragedies would have happened. The hanging of 19 people, the pressing of one person to death, seven people dying in jail, two of whom were babies, about a hundred people, including children, tortured and chained up in filthy dungeons, many people's entire property confiscated, children uncared for, lives ruined, farms lying fallow, people's mental health destroyed, none of this would have happened if these people had had the right to a fair trial. So what was going on at these hearings and later on at the trials? Basically, the accused would be brought in and the accusers would enter a hysterical state and cry out that the accused were sending out their spirits to hurt them or that they had seen the spirits of the accused with the spirits of other witches. And this kind of testimony was called spectral evidence. And if things weren't going the way that the accusers wanted, their fits would get worse. The judges allowed and encouraged this. And there's actually a moment where a judge wants to establish some facts. So he talks to the accused away from the accusers because there's just nothing calm or measured about what's going on. And there's a level on which the judge does understand this. However, the entire process was focused on the accusers and they were given absolute power and they made it their job to appear as sympathetic as possible. They were sticking pins in themselves, they were biting themselves, which some people did observe at the time, but people in general chose to believe that this was just happening by magic because they just couldn't bear to imagine that these young women were shamming because if they were, 
they were ruthless murderers. Francis Hill draws the comparison with the satanic abuse panic from the 1980s and the 1990s, which was later found to just entirely be made up. But it happened because therapists were asking children leading questions. And it was an example of how adults can lose their ability to be rational when we think of the most horrible things imaginable happening to the most vulnerable and innocent people in society. And we will dehumanise anyone we suspect might be capable of doing these things. Even if it's not true, even if we're not 100% sure that it's true, just the suggestion that someone is harming innocent and vulnerable people is enough to stop us from being rational. We want to protect children and we want to protect young girls, even though both these groups, particularly in the case of Salem, are shown to be capable of making up all kinds of untrue things for many different reasons. In Salem, there were little children who were jailed for telling these crazy stories about how they were witches, which, you know, adults had obviously fed to them, but also, you know, children make up stories. Anyone who has a four-year-old like I do will know that they take things that are around them and things that they've heard and make crazy stories up. And of course, there were also older individuals who were just out and out lying. And the way to deal with the fact that this can happen is very clear. We must not be able to destroy someone on the basis of an accusation alone. And when it's possible to do this, we no longer live in a civilized society. We actually saw this way back in 2012, 2013 with the Gregory Allen Elliott case. He and somebody called Stephanie Guthrie were basically just having a Twitter argument and Guthrie got him arrested because she said she felt harassed. And the key thing is that there was no actual threat that had been made. The whole thing rested on whether she felt scared, which of course, like the spectral evidence of the witch trials is very conveniently a proofless crime. When we start dealing with evidence that's unfalsifiable, we end up in a situation where people who have fanatical beliefs get into a state where they just can't differentiate between facts and feelings or between people and their spirits. It's just not okay for us to allow people to just stand there and look vulnerable and make up evidence as they see, see fit, while making sure that actual evidence is not heard. So for example, in the Giangameshi case, when it was clearly demonstrated that the accusers had colluded and lied, the response from activists was to campaign for the evidence which proved him innocent to be barred from similar trials in future. This is about keeping emotional evidence in and actual evidence out. What Arthur Miller demonstrates really clearly with the character Abigail Williams is how accusers end up with this sense of entitlement and that's something we've seen a lot of in recent years. For example, Gregory Allen Elliott's accuser was being asked some really serious questions in court about whether she was targeting him because she didn't like his politics and she actually was sitting there rolling her eyes instead of taking these questions seriously. Um, and likewise, Gomeshi's accuser was actually found to have said before the trial, this is going to be theatre at its best. And as you will know, if you're familiar with either of these cases, these women were simply stunned when things didn't go the way they had expected. And their response was to demonise the accused even more. And they also had these mobs of supporters ready to brand anyone who questioned them with terms like sexist, which nowadays can affect a person's social standing, just like a cry of witch could hundreds of years ago. This is a way to threaten sceptics into silence because you don't actually need to go to court if you are powerful enough to destroy someone who's done nothing wrong and then just move on. So even though this is a section about due process, I just want to talk a bit about the state that accusers are in when they go into a courtroom and lie. Because this emotional state is what replaces rationality and it's important to think about what's going on when people are in this state. And also a lot of people that we've seen behave like this more recently clearly feel that they're behaving morally and they're also clearly very intelligent. And the point that I want to make is that there's a very fine line between lies and self-delusion. So for example, if you remember the case of Tim Hunt, who was accused of making sexist remarks in a speech that was at an event in honour of women in science, Tape recordings proved that the accuser's narrative was false. Nobody was offended. There was warm applause after the speech, but the accuser had said that there was a deathly silence when he finished speaking and everyone was really offended. And I actually think there's room for the accuser here to have convinced herself of this, you know, to be in a state of half belief where she 
maybe remembered that silence because her own indignation drowned out everything else that was around her. So what state were the Salem accusers in? Um, in the crucible, the accusers' fits are very much contrived. However, Frances Hill is very generous in her assumptions of what's going on. And she actually leaves a lot of room for assuming that in many cases, the, the accusers were genuinely terrified or believed what was going on. However, even she makes it very clear that there are just so many moments where there was outright contrived deception going on. And, you know, we're never going to know what the reality actually was, but it did probably start off as genuine hysteria. And as can be common with hysteria, there's this degree of letting go, but there's also a degree of control. So, for example, these accusers, when they were going into this state, they would often threaten to do things like stick their hand in the fire, they would try and jump in the lake, but they would always kind of tell somebody that they were about to do it, or if they were about to throw a knife at someone, they would always kind of give a warning and make sure that nobody actually ever got hurt. And these people, you know, they're not necessarily happy, they're not necessarily enjoying it when they're doing things like this, but it is clearly fulfilling a need for them. And we also know that people in these hysterical states can believe in what's happening and they can also be highly suggestible. And I think we see a lot of activists nowadays who have been kind of trained to enter a semi-hysterical state, uh, particularly when any issues that they consider to be sort of their issues are being discussed outside of their terms. And that you see them go into this state of panic and alert, it's kind of like a flight or fight or flight state um, and it's almost like they're having a religious experience and when they're in this state there's certain behaviors that they would normally never ever even think about doing they suddenly think it's okay to do this stuff and I don't know if you've ever been having a fight and you're so angry you're almost outside yourself watching yourself and then something else from inside you just takes over what you're doing and I think you know people can do some really really crazy and dangerous things when they are in this state Get your hand off my dress now! Get your hand off my dress now! So this was a state that the Salem accusers could clearly work themselves up to, like actors before going on stage, or berserk soldiers in the past who used to work themselves into some kind of frenzy before going into battle. However, as things moved on, it becomes clear that there was increasing awareness and control over what was going on. The accusers were most hysterical when they were most being challenged. So if somebody was confessing or giving in, they would stop. And the most extreme fits they ever had happened when it looked like Rebecca Nurse, who was their sort of second biggest target, was going to be released. And they reversed the way that things were going by going absolutely crazy. And, you know, I do believe that they were triggered. I believe that people today who say they are triggered are triggered. But what is it that triggers them? What triggers them is things not going their way and nearly getting busted. Um, there was also an instance relatively early on um, when they tried to accuse Elizabeth Proctor and they were, they were actually in a tavern, which is probably a much kind of calmer environment than the meeting house where all the trials and hearings were held. And they actually weren't surrounded by these adults who were very invested in the situation. So um, these girls start saying, there's Goody Proctor, oh, she's an old witch, I'll have her hang they actually didn't manage to work themselves up enough and the people around them could actually see that they were lying and told them off. So what did the girls do? They say, oh, we were just joking. They actually said, we did it for sport. We must have some sport. And you know, this is proper primary school behavior. You know, kid says something that they realize is gonna get them into trouble. They say, oh, no, I was just kidding. That was just a joke. Um, so we have these hysterical individuals who we know are working themselves into a frenzy which, you know, takes away people's ability to be calm. And then we add into this situation the fear of people that people have of being accused. And suddenly ordinary people aren't going to be willing to stand up in court and say that the emperor has no clothes on. And so these lying and manipulative and hysterical children are just allowed to run the show. But there is one final ingredient which just made it impossible for justice to function. And that is the outright, carefully planned, 
lying on the part of adults who are supposed to be responsible and many of whom are in positions of power. So this allows Reverend Paris and the Putnam family to set up people that they have grievances against very carefully and particularly we see this in the case of George Burroughs. So the accusers start off by first you know mentioning his name when actually he wasn't even in Salem, he was in a town far away um, and they start slowly slowly in the visions that they describe setting him up to be the leader of this kind of coven of witches and he's the person who's in charge of getting people to sign their name in the devil's book and make a pact with the devil and they also start telling these stories from the past the younger girls and Putnam particularly she tells stories about his he's got two uh, dead wives and she mentions things about them which must have been fed to her by her parents. Um, and the other thing that supposedly responsible adults must have been involved with was setting up the trials to happen in a very careful order so that the lowest status people with the sort of strongest evidence against them who kind of seem the most like witches would go first and then they very carefully build their way up to accusing people like Rebecca Nurse and then finally George Burroughs. Um, and, you know, the great and the good of society were in on this. And that's what's so terrifying. And today there are so many examples of educated, intelligent people who very clearly think that lying doesn't even matter if it's for a good enough cause. Just think about the case of Jussie Smollett. Aside from everyone either being dishonest or having lost their minds, there were also many other aspects of due process that were just not functioning here. Judges forgot that people should be assumed innocent until proven guilty. Judges forgot that witnesses can lie. Judges lacked impartiality or professionalism. Many of the judges were without legal training. Judges were not following their own internal procedures. Judges forgot that this was an examination and not a trial. One side of the argument was allowed to cherry pick as they saw fit. And the accused were not entitled to defence lawyers and Francis Hill argues that this was because they were not seeking the truth but assuming they knew it. They saw themselves as upholders of divine revelation about which there could be no debate, end quote. Now luckily our court system today is slightly more robust than it was 300 years ago so fanatics today often don't want to go to court. They want people to be interrogated secretly at institutions like universities where Every single point on the list that I just read out has become a serious problem. Go and listen to the interrogation of Lindsay Shepherd and think of the phrase upholders of divine revelation about which there can be no debate. So how did the Salem witch trials wind down and come to an end? The first thing that is important to mention is that people always knew what was going on from the beginning, but they just couldn't say it because they knew that they would be accused next. We know that scepticism was growing in Salem throughout, and Francis Hill writes that the other side of the coin from the hardening of belief was the deepening of scepticism. And I think we see a lot of that in our modern society. We have a culture war going on, and there are two groups of people who believe very different things about how the world works and whose objective is just to bring each other down. They're really not communicating with each other to find a solution or an outcome. Um, in order for things to stop in Salem, one very important thing had to happen, which is that people had to stop being cowards. Many thought that they could be brave and then, you know, after they were tortured, they just confessed to whatever the torturers wanted them to confess to. And I think we have to respect them for trying their best. But those who did have the bravery not to confess and to give their lives for it were the ones that started the beginning of the end. The speeches and the prayers that the people who were executed made on the gallows and the bravery of, of Giles Corey when he was pressed to death was so moving that it changed people's hearts and minds to an extent that at the executions, the accusers felt so undermined, they went into crazy fits to try and win back sympathy for themselves. But it was because of this bravery that people finally realised it was more dangerous not to speak out, which is something we hear people like Jordan Peterson say. 
Um, at, at the time, writers started expressing, you know, proper counter arguments. People start signing letters uh, at great risk to themselves. Um, and although a lot of the great and the good start doing this because they actually start realizing, no, they are going to come for us as well. People in wealthy and powerful families start being accused. Accused. It, it ended because many people stood up and spoke and put their names on a piece of paper at the same time. And once enough people had expressed skepticism, people stopped giving the accusers the attention that they wanted and they stopped making accusations. And what happened was the accusers were actually um, crossing a bridge and they saw some old, old woman and they started crying out at her and having fits and saying she was a witch. Um, and what happened? The people around them just ignored it and moved on. And the girls calmed down. They they didn't labour the point. They realised that their their influence was over and they never actually accused anyone again. Ideologues are their own worst enemies. The Salem witch accusers' downfall was the fact that they started to accuse the wrong people and they started accusing way too many people. We should never, ever silence people like this. When they saw that last old woman on the bridge, the people were able to ignore them precisely because they could hear how ridiculous the things they were saying actually were. We don't need to stop these people convincing themselves. All we need to do is stop them taking our rights away. Another important lesson is to be brave from the beginning, because if you give an inch, people like this will take a mile. If you say a little sorry when they accuse you of sexism or witchcraft or whatever, they have got you playing their game. When witch accusations started happening in a nearby town called Andover, somebody there accused a worthy gentleman of Boston, and what this worthy gentleman did was issue a writ demanding a thousand pounds for defamation, and that was the end of people accusing him, and it also pretty much ended the witch hunt in Andover as well. Another important lesson that we can learn from this is to be grateful for what we actually do have and to try and work against this instinct that we have to always focus on negative things. Steven Pinker of course writes books about how we've never had you know such a comfortable life and also you know Dave Rubin likes to remind young people that they've never had it so good and yet there are of course so many people around who just want to obsess over the problems that we do have and by doing that really seem to be making those problems a whole lot worse. Um, and I just want to draw a comparison with um, something that happened when some of the Salem accusers were describing visions of witches and um, some of them actually had visions of Christ coming and scaring these witches and then showing these the accusers these visions of heaven which they actually describe in a lot of detail. And Francis Hill points out that some scholars have made the point that if the adults around the afflicted girls had shown more interest in the visions of Christ and his angels and less in their sightings of witches and devils, they might have caused them to instigate not a witch hunt, but a religious revival. Um, and of course, I am not saying that we do not have problems because, you know, of course we do. But I think the way that we encourage young people to focus their energies is going to affect how they behave when they're trying to do the right thing, because everyone in their life is hopefully trying to do the right thing. But people who think they have all the answers can end up doing really awful things to impose their belief on others. And I think, you know, we all have this impulse. We all want people to agree with us, but we just have to try to counteract that impulse by remembering the things that we have in common. You know, we all want to be forgiven. We all want to be treated with tolerance. And I think we should maybe all just try to remember that we should treat each other with the respect that we would like to be given, even though that can, of course, be really, really hard sometimes. So that was my video about witch hunts. Uh, are you still here? If, if you're still here, congratulations. I probably wouldn't still be here. Uh, I'm sick of the sound of my own voice, so I'm guessing you probably are too. Uh, please let me know what you thought. Uh, please tell me which bits you thought were boring, which bits you thought were interesting. Uh, I kind of felt like the whole thing was a uh, confused, disorganized mess and uh, my editing skills are really really poor um so yeah thank you for watching obviously like subscribe yada yada and that's the end of my video bye bye